Okay, um, we are here, I'm Brenda Draper, and we are here with Seth Jones, who is a musician, a folk musician, a country singer, and I believe it's eclectic, right? Yeah, the, the album was, was uh, the Puzzle Man album was mainly country, but I myself would probably be way more eclectic because I've done punk music as well, which is nothing like folk music. You know, I've done folk and, and also country. Yes. And um, we have interest on your music because twice a year, sometimes three times a year, I teach cultural comparisons. So we can, we compare art and part of the arts is music. Um, so first question, what inspired you to become a musician? Um, let me think back. Um, well, I've always been creative. I'm, I'm left-handed and I do think like a left-handed, a typical left-handed person. So I've always liked to create things. I used to draw a lot when I was a kid and, uh, <clears throat> And I never liked, I never liked creating things with a blueprint. I liked creating things from scratch. And then when I started playing music, just because I could drum, and I had bands in high school that I would drum and sing in, then I started writing songs for those bands, and I immediately really enjoyed writing songs. So, I guess the, I guess the inspiration was. Uh, just wanting to create something and then realizing I could do it with music, which is a little more rewarding and interactive than just drawing a picture. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, which impact do you think your music has specifically on young people? <clears throat> mm, I don't... <clears throat> understand young people all very well um, and I don't interact with a whole lot of them but I think I think anyone no matter what their age is if they listen to the lyrics would be affected similarly <clears throat> maybe maybe young people not as much because they haven't experienced as much so like songs like Never Learn, they, they might not even understand that at this point in their life. <clears throat> but um, uh, from a music business perspective, there's not as much country music as there used to be, like real country music with fiddle and steel guitar and mandolin. <clears throat> so hopefully in that regard, <clears throat> some of them are sort of discovering country music through me or discovering this type of sound. And uh, that's that can be beneficial to me because although I'm just regurgitating American, old American classic standard music, you know, traditional American music, they might think that I'm making something brand new. I'm not going to pretend like I am. If they ask how I came up with the sound, I will tell them. It's, I didn't come up with it. Someone else did. But... From a musical standpoint, I think that's the impact. They're thinking, oh, this is some cool new music I haven't heard before. Maybe. That's that's my guess anyway. Thank you. Yes, um, I've had, I don't think I've had any student that has told me that they're into country, but they have found touching quality in those lyrics. Okay, uh, what is the relationship that you observe between our community here in Dallas-Fort Worth area and your lyrics and your, and your themes, lyrics and themes? Like the, the people around here, what they've what they've gotten from it or what how it's affected my writing being here um the relationship back and forth between 
do you see a relationship back and forth between your music and our community here in Dallas Fort Worth area? Uh, everything, everything is relative. So you have to always remember that. <clears throat> so me relative to some other artists, I basically have had next to no interaction. Like most people, most people have not heard of me. That's, it's no different in the DFW area. Most people in DFW have not heard of me. <clears throat> um, so relative to a huge Texas star or American star, um, there has, there's been virtually no interaction. However, relative to where I was before I started making music, which is where no one knew about me, um, the few people that, that I do interact with and have reached out to me and have become fans, that's been very positive because I think that when your fan base is smaller, they're more rabid. They're more, there's more zealotry behind their, their fandom. Like they're, they're more passionate. They care more. There's sort of a feeling of this is, this is my guy. I know about him. You know, other people don't. It's more like it feels like an exclusive club. I know about that because I've felt that way about bands before. When they're not very popular, it kind of makes me it, – it brings me closer to that band. It seems like a secret club that not many people know about. So I think I kind of have that going on with some people in DFW. And just – I mean, not just DFW, though. That They could be anywhere, you know, around the world, around Texas, all – all my small fan base has that same type of feel about them. Uh, but DFW specifically, it's not much of a community, honestly. It's a metropolitan area, you know. It, um, I'd say the community aspect are my friends and acquaintances within DFW, which might be what you're asking initially anyway. But, uh, of course, those people, they're, they're my friends anyway, so – they've been very positive and supportive and I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Would you consider yourself as a country folk musician or else? I guess that's one of the repetitive questions, but I can what answer. would be your preferred genre, genre of musical identification? Do you have a preferred genre? Uh, right now, I think my preference is country. Uh -huh. because, uh, there's, there actually, when people, people like to talk about like genres mean nothing or genres are blurred, but when you, when you put your music out on these websites, on these applications to be heard, these digital stores, you do have to literally pick a genre. So it is relative. I mean, it is relevant. You have to, you have to say whether you're rock or folk or country or rap or R and B or funk or whatever, you have to put something. And I put country rock and folk, I think. And I suppose that's what I would like to be identified as right now. But, um, it really doesn't, it really doesn't matter personally outside of the business aspect because I kind of, Although I make country music, I do like when people point out the fact that it has rock and roll elements in it. And in fact, the next album has a song that is undeniably just a rock and roll song. Um, so that's really going to throw people for a loop when they try to figure out what genre I am. But I think the easy answer would be, the easy answer is probably alt country. I don't know if you've heard of that, alternative country. Or I don't know, uh, I don't know anything about music. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of there's lots of weird subgenres people make up, uh, but country is the easy answer. And um, if you want to get a little more specific, like country rock, maybe country rock or alt country. Okay. As uh, someone asked a specific question about Lighthouse, the song. Uh, does this song affect you personally? If so, how? Um, the song from 
from like the perspective of a listener, like if I was just listening to it and appreciating it, it doesn't affect me a lot because I wrote it. Um, I don't know. There's some saying about like, I don't know the saying, but something about like, if you, if you take part in the process, it's not as magical for you. Oh. It's that song kind of falls into that category. Now I do have songs that I have written that when I listen to them, they do affect me, but those usually aren't happy songs. Happy, happy songs don't really affect me much. It's the, the sad, depressing, dark ones that do. Um, and Lighthouse obviously is a happier, more positive song. So when I listen to it, it doesn't really affect me much, but obviously as with any song, anything you create, when people, when people say they like it or listen to it or share it, that affects me, you know, that makes me happy, but you can say that about any song. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, where was the songwriter born? Where were where you born? Oh, where was I born? I was born, I actually went, I went like 28 years thinking I was born in Tyler. And then my mom, very matter of fact, they told me I wasn't. I was born in Henderson, which is the closest town to the little dirt road camp I grew up in. Henderson was, uh, still is a very small town, but it has a hospital and a Walmart and fast food places. So that's significantly bigger than my town. Uh, but I was born in Henderson, Texas. And that hospital is probably 10 minutes from the house I grew up in, 10 or 15 minutes. So I was, I was basically born right by my house. You know, nothing crazy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, says in here, did you get academic literacy studies? They mean like advanced literacy studies in order to be able to write your lyrics. I did not. I, I'll, advanced, definitely not. I learned basic reading and writing in English. And I was actually always I always excelled at writing in general, like even if it was just writing a story. We'd, in school, we'd have these projects to write, you know, whatever, how to or a narrative or freestyle, which was my favorite because I don't like blueprints or, you know, whatever. Any, any writing assignment, I would always do very, very well on it. I would, I would actually impress the teachers and they were, they're always making a big deal out of it. And I did, I, I thought it was good too. You know, that's why I did it. I wouldn't have, I would have changed it if I thought it was bad. Um, but they really liked it a lot, which made me think, oh, maybe I am good at writing. Uh, so I've always been good at words. I mean, I'm equally as bad at math. I'm not good at math things, uh, physics things, things involving numbers. They, they just kind of, they scramble in my brain. My brain deletes it before I can finish it. It's really strange. Um, but words, I'm very good at words, very bad at numbers. And I didn't, I, I'm not even sure how much advanced literacy courses would help songwriting. I think the best way to, to be good at songwriting is one, do be good at words, do be good at linguistic, ling, linguistics. That's ironic that I couldn't say that. Be good at at weaving words together and uh, be an emotional person so that you can use that, not just for inspiration, but for knowing which, literally which lines invoke more emotion than other lines. Sometimes you can change a word from, from one word to another word that, has, that grabs people more and that catches them in the throat when they hear that line. And then the most important part is you just practice. You do it over and over and over. You can, if you write, if you write songs every day for four years, that, that is significantly more useful than going to school to learn how to write and 
do poetry, blah, 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 for 10 years. You have to mm -hmm. literally do what you're trying to get better at. Do it over and over. Keep trying to improve. And I did it for uh, over 10 years just because I wanted to. It wouldn't work. It wasn't school. It didn't cost money. I just wanted to do it. I think that's how people get great at stuff. You know, like Michael Jordan wanted to play basketball. I mean, that's all he wanted to do. I don't know if you know who Michael Jordan is. He's insane. He's, a, he's widely known as the greatest athlete of all time, basketball player. But okay. I don't blame you if you don't know who he is, but most people do around the world. But anyway, he, anyone that's great at something, I think usually that's what they want to do. And school's over. They go straight to whatever they wanted to do. When they wake up in the morning, they think about what they want to do. But that's how I'll – that's how I've been with songwriting for the most part. Thank you. Which instruments w were used in the song? Did you have a particular say of which instruments were there and why? I, I said, I told them, when the album, before the album even started, and I talked to the producer, I said, drums, bass guitar, uh, rhythm guitar, or lead guitar, just guitar in general, and uh, drums, bass guitar, and fiddle. I wanted bass, regular guitar, drums, and fiddle. Mm -hmm. And I knew that regular guitar would entail acoustic and electric because that guitar player can do both most guitar players can <clears throat> so i knew i would have those four instruments <coughs> excuse me um but then <clears throat> after the first we recorded four songs and then one day i came into the studio <clears throat> and our fiddle player hank was not there and there was another man there with really long hair and he looked like a mad scientist he was carrying several cases and uh, I was a little nervous thinking what's going on here, but I didn't say anything. And then the producer, Paul said, Hank couldn't be here today. He, he lives too far away. He said, it's not really worth coming in unless he's doing six or more songs, which made sense. He's trying to make money. And if he's not making enough money to justify the trip, he shouldn't come. So then I was really nervous. I thought, oh, we got another musician in here that I don't know anything about. But he said, we have Milo, and he just got finished touring with the Eagles, which the Eagles is arguably the greatest American band of all time, definitely one of them. <laughs> so that was impressive. And Milo actually plays whatever instrument he wants to, almost literally. And so Milo came in and without me even asking, played steel guitar, and mandolin and uh, those end up sounding very very good and uh, Lighthouse does have steel guitar I'm not sure about mandolin I'd have to listen to it again um, but it definitely has steel guitar all in it and uh, I did not like I said I did not mention steel guitar they just put it in there and it ended up, ended up sounding great and now that I have Milo he, I have steel guitar all over my songs on the next album too, which I'm very happy about. And he doesn't care about just playing a few songs. He nope. does it for fun. Well, that that's true, but also Milo lives closer than Hank. Hank lives like past Corsicana. That's a far drive. I think Milo lives in DFW. Oh, okay. Um, there's a question here. Who is the singer uh, asking all uh, those questions in the song too? Wait just a second. Reba! Reba! I don't know how to mute. Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. I have a dog too. Bronco. Yes. Uh, who is the singer asking all those questions mentioned in the song to? Um, has it been dedicated to someone in particular? No, Lighthouse was not, not dedicated to anyone. 
and uh, it was not written with anyone in particular in mind. It was just a, a feeling and like a, a, a common story, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does the sailor's metaphor mean? Um, I remember answering this one, but I forgot what I said. But uh, basically, it's it's just a it's a nautical theme. The whole song is themed on a lighthouse and the ocean and the shoreline. And uh, the uh, basically, if it's saying if if you are on the water, if you're lost on the water, then I'll, I'm your lighthouse. I'll I'll help guide you to shore. It's a, it's all metaphorical for love and trust and stuff like that. Okay. Um, there's one question here. It says you, you are using elaborate metaphors in the lyrics. That is that a signature in your songs? If so, why? <clears throat> I think, I, I don't know a lot about music from other countries, especially lyrically, because I don't understand the lyrics and I almost never looked them up. So I don't know how those songs are written, but a lot of American music does use metaphors and uh, a lot of like abstract things and they don't always say exactly what's going on, you know, specifically. I just think, I think metaphors are powerful ways to convey emotion and be, and, you know, make a point and also be clever. They're very clever, unique metaphors. There, there are many songwriters that use metaphors, but they're not good. They're not unique or clever. They're refurbished. I like really unique, clever metaphors that, that can grab people. Um, these students come from I have students from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the United States. And they, a couple of them had the impression that the type of metaphor, it was a little more elaborate than what they used to hear or read or, you know, than I don't know much about the, the metaphors level one or level two or level three. I don't know, but that's what they were saying. Yeah, I guess the whole song's a metaphor mm -hmm. in a way, you know, so that's, yeah. it, it doesn't get much more elaborate than the entire song being a metaphor. Yeah, something like that. Like there's one inside of another metaphor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, buried. Okay. Um, what are you trying to say with if you keep your mind at ease you can keep your heart that was a question about that letter they studied them <laughs> they went into what this is mean or that one that means I, remember that, that I found that question on here uh if you can keep your mind at ease no you can keep your mind at ease if you can keep your heart full of love that's the proper lyric and it makes a little more sense with just those little different word changes there. Um, and basically it's about love bringing peace and uh, like knowing that the person loves you, brings you peace. You don't have to, that's a big component of life that you don't have to worry about. You can, that you can be at peace knowing that, that you have a partner, that someone loves you and will not forsake you and does care for you the way you care for them. That's a big deal. And, uh, you know, you can keep your mind at ease. So don't worry about that stuff. Don't, don't think that you're going to be alone in life, but you can keep your mind at ease. If you can keep your heart full of love, meaning, you know, if you love, if you trust that I love you the way that you love me, then, and your heart is full of love, then you'll know that that you're getting that reciprocated to you. 
So don't worry about it. There's no worries. Keep your mind at ease. Um, any plans for the future? Yeah, the my plan. I, I make I make short term plans, and uh, I deal with it as it comes, as opposed to making long time plans and trying to fit my life to that. My short term plan is uh, to keep working to make money. One to live and pay bills and two so that I continue recording more music <clears throat> and uh, my my next album is almost done honestly I could probably release it now but I just want to be sure everything's the way I want it because these songs will last my whole life and I would like listening listening to them so <laughs> that songs that album's close to being done I might release a track or two early because that's what gets people's attention. They can focus on these one or two songs and not get bogged down by an entire album. And then the album will release. Um, it's going to have maybe 14 or 15 songs on it. So there's more songs. I could put more. I have, I have so many songs. People don't understand how many songs I have and I keep writing them, but I'm going to put, I think 14 on this album and uh, it's going to be a very, it's going to be, I haven't thought of the right words for it. I was thinking about this, uh, an analogy I just used this morning, um, a smaller, very fun roller coaster. Okay. That was the Puzzle Man album. The next album, it, I'm not saying it's better or more fun, but it's a bigger, more elaborate roller coaster. <clears throat> so what I mean by that basically is there's more songs it's a the songs vary more in their sound and the genre there's a duet me and a girl she sings a, a verse by herself and we sing the chorus together there's um, backing vocals so there's a another singer with me in the background to make it sound better there's a, a rock and roll song very rock and roll. And there's a song with a classical violin, which sounds pretty incredible. That's going to make people's eyes get real big when they hear it. So it's, I'm not saying the album's better, but it is definitely different and there's more to it. So I do think that many people will, I think many people will think it's better, but I'm not going to say whether it's better or worse. I'll let people decide, but it's definitely, uh, definitely a good quality album that I'm, I know that people that like Puzzle Man will like this one, so I'm not worried about that at all. I'm actually excited. I think most people will love this album. Yes. Um, is there a lot of people sensing what I stands with some of your songs? Um, I mean, I, I love the, the recording recorded sessions i really do and I, I won't stop listening to them because they have um and a quality sound that i really like the song puzzle man i i really like the recording in your room that you did yeah something yeah. about the way you sing it there's there's an there's something, do, do people have that connection with, with the voice, just the voice, even if it has not a whole lot of instruments? And yeah, that's a different, that's a different experience altogether. <laughs> in fact, it's, it's common in, in America, in my past at least, for bands to have a couple, you know, one, one to five studio albums one to eight studio album, you know, a bunch of, they have a career, right? And, uh, and eventually they do an acoustic album. Oftentimes it's a live acoustic album, whether it in, in an auditorium or a small theater and they play acoustic songs and they're usually fantastic. Um, and then sometimes they'll just, they'll do a studio acoustic album where they go to the studio and it's just the guitar and the vocals and maybe, one other instrument. And like I said, it's a different experience. 
it's stripped down. People say it's stripped down. You take away all the bells and whistles and you just got the voice and the melody and an instrument. Um, but I'm still going to make those videos and I do, I am going to do different types of albums at some point. I, if I had, if I won the lottery and had $500 million, I would do a puzzle man album, the same album and all the songs would be done like classical wedding style, like a piano and a cello. Um, it would, it, the whole album would be like wedding instrumental. I would do that because I think that would be beautiful. So trust me, I'm, I'm the type of person that will do the, that type of weird stuff. It just, it's all in due time. Okay. We are going to wrap this with one question that you think people should ask. And I have it. <coughs> Feel free to do more. But. Well, you want me to, to answer any, to give any comment? No, to, if there is a question you think it would be nice to be asked, ask uh, it and then answer it. Ask my own question and answer Yes. It. Okay. Mm. Well, it's a, I don't know what the question would be, but I'll just, I'll say it and we can form a question around it later. But here's my answer to the question that wasn't asked. My answer is, um, I don't, when I make music, I have no plan to turn a profit. I have no plan. Uh, when I release an album onto the internet, the album costs a lot of money and I get pennies back. There's very little return on the investment. The investment is not for profit. If I made a lot of money from it someday, that would be awesome. I want that, trust me. But that's, there's no plan for that. I'm not a business person. I'm not a businessman. Um, so when I work really, really hard all week, every week, and use the money to record music, I'm doing that because I, I need to. I want to and I need to. It's not for money, not for profit. I promise you most people that make music, they're, they're expecting to make a profit somehow. I don't know why. Maybe they want to be able to continue funding their music. That's probably the case a lot of the time. And a lot of them, they just want to be rich. They want to be rich and famous. <laughs> but the profits aren't, aren't the reason I do it. I want people to know that they're listening to music and supporting someone that really is doing it for the sake, sake of the songs and the music and the art. That really is me. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm even set up to be someone to make money from music because I'm so naturally rebellious. I feel like if I was, if I did get really popular and started making money, I'd probably change everything. I'd change the sound. I'd change a lot about what I do and I'd get my fan base back down on purpose, whether I like it or not. It's very strange. I'm self-destructive in that way. Uh, I always have been. <clears throat> so no, people don't have to worry about me becoming corporate or fake or trying to steal their money. None of that's ever going to happen with me. Uh, I can guarantee I'm too, I'm old enough to know who I am and what I am. Um, so I just want people to know that that's not a concern. And I do appreciate, also very much appreciate now that I'm talking to you and these other people, I appreciate the, uh, the international attention. I didn't even consider that at all. I never thought about it. I never thought I'm going to try to get on uh, British radio or Australian radio or Mexican radio. It didn't, didn't cross my mind. I only thought about Texas. Honestly, I didn't even think about, Alabama or Florida. I, I didn't care. I wanted to be big in Texas. And although I do have plenty of fans in Texas, I got fans around the world too. And that's awesome. And if I, if I ever got, for example, if I got huge in Germany, 
like way bigger in Germany than Texas, I would gladly go to Germany to play shows, you know, if they appreciate me. I'm, that's not what I imagined in my head. I love Texas. I would love to stay in Texas and play shows in Texas. But if another country valued my songs more and got more out of them, I would definitely go there and play for them. Thank you so much for this interview because I know your time is tight. I get a feeling. I make myself very busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate it. And right, well, thank you. Thanks for your time, Brenda. I appreciate you interviewing me. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.